Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Lake of Biblical Life Assembly, and I want to welcome you to our second episode of the reboot of our video ministry, Biblical Life Assembly, where we are building a virtual community for the remnant of God together. Now, over the past three weeks have been busy ones for us. We celebrated Hanukkah last week and just had a great time with family, really enjoyed the presence of God. We have been developing our Biblical Life Deep Water podcast for Biblical Life College and Seminary. We've also begun the process of uh, redesigning and, and redoing all of our websites, which we hope to have done by the first of the year. We've also been praying and fasting for a fresh anointing to see the power of God and the purpose of the kingdom to be released in your life. So I, I'm really believing that as, we're, as we head into episode two, which is moving forward in our jubilee, that God is releasing some new things in your life. I want you to go forward. I want you to be able to have the peace of God and the, and the power of God in your home. In your last episode, we dealt with the truth that God is releasing a fresh anointing, a fresh wind of heaven for his remnant, and that includes a year of jubilee. I cannot tell you how many times in the last several months that God, in our own family, that he has just kind of adjusted our perspective on things. And when he did, freedom came. It, it, it wasn't that there was a radical dynamic change. It's this God saying, listen, you're looking at this just a little bit from the wrong perspective, and that when you do that, it, it's, it's almost like a, a water hose that when you kink it, 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 it will restrict the flow of the water. And when our perspective is off, when the devil can get us off just a little bit, it kinks the flow from heaven, and God is saying, I need to readjust you to get all the kinks out that the devil's put in your life so that you can really flow where I want you to, sto- st- to flow. So I want to ask you today, have you been examining your ways? We have. And uh, I believe that's why that God has been adjusting so many things in our life. And guys, really, it has been profound. I wish I almost want to do just a, a video just sharing all the things that, that God has shown us and that, and that God has tweaked just a little bit, but that little tweak makes such a difference. We discovered last week in Haggai 1, 2 through 9 that God told his people they were working hard, they were working, they were putting money in the bags, but the bags had holes in them, that they were trying to fill up their houses, but their houses could never be filled. And he said, the reason all of your work was not really coming to the place that you needed it to be was because you laid my house desolate. Now, right here, a lot of preachers would, would stop and begin talking about building a sanctuary or building a church building. But we also discovered in the day that we're living in, you and I are the house of God. God is returning us to a walk with him that is powerful. He wants it to be from our homes on out. It's first us as an individual, then our families, and then community. I want you to turn to Genesis 1.1. I want to show you something out of the Word of God, and I want you to see this not from Greco-Roman eyes, but rabbinical eyes. Up on your screen, you see Genesis 1-1, and it's it's a, a transliteration. I want you to see the Hebrew, and it reads, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamaim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, one of the things that the rabbis had pondered for years is why did God start the Torah with the second letter of the alphabet? You see, for rabbis, when they, 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 they believe, especially with Torah, because it was dictated verbatim, face-to-face, Moses was face-to-face with God, and God said, let me give, you, give this to you word for word. And so the Torah has a, a, a uniqueness to it that all the other uh, books of the Bible don't have and that it wasn't just men moved by the Holy Ghost uh, that wrote things down as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's Almighty God met Moses face to face and said, write it word for word what I'm telling you. So why did God 
start with the second letter instead of the first because from them, from their mindset, an Aleph would have been a much better way of starting the Torah because Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet. It has a, a, um, a number value of one which would explain one of the greatest truths in the word of God, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So why would God not start with that? We also, when we begin understanding what the, each Hebrew letter has a numeric value, it also has, uh, it also has a, it's associated with something. It was originally almost like hieroglyphics. It represented something. And so the olive looked like the ox. It represented strength. And it would say that God created the heavens and the earth based upon his strength. But he didn't do that. God started his Torah with bet. Now it has a numerical value of two. But what's significant about it, bet means house. And God, in the beginning, God built himself a house for his family. If you could get that, if you could understand that the creation story is all about Almighty God building a house because he was creating a family for himself. He did not want servants. He already had, he already had angels, legions of angels that served him day and night. And none of them were created in his image. Yet he created Adam and Eve in his image because he wanted to be a father. Now we can actually take the whole of the word of God can be summed up this way. God created a house and he created a family. His enemy came into the garden and stole his house and stole his family. Makes sense, doesn't it? When, when Adam fell in the garden, he was born again for the first time. He went from the nature of God to the nature of Lucifer. And Lucifer became the God, little g, of this world. He stole his house. He stole his family. Almighty God came and gave his own life to get his family and his house back. We are now spreading the good news that we can get back into God's family. The spirit of adoption is the spirit of the Holy Spirit. And when we preach the cross, it's about having our sins forgiven, and there is a new birth that happens. I am birthed back into the family of God, and one day he, Jesus, is coming back to take back his house. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. He's coming back to have his reign, to have his day, to have his Sabbath day in the earth. And when he comes back, he will gather his family, and he's going to throw his enemy out of his house. Now, have you ever heard a simpler yet more profound explanation of the gospel? God created a house and a family long before he created a temple. It was all family-based. It was individually based. Originally under the Torah, they only went to Jerusalem three times a year. In the Torah, there are three times a year that every male is required to appear before God. And it is the, uh, the Passover... Shavuot or Pentecost, and the Day of Atonement. Those three days, they're required to appear before God. All the rest of the time, they walked with God in their homes and in their communities, and Levites were embedded within their communities to teach each man, to teach each family how to walk with God the exact same way that Abraham walked with God. Now, under Nehemiah and, and Ezra, uh, during the Babylonian captivity, the synagogue system was created, uh, and, uh, which, though, it still had a heavy emphasis on training and empowering the family to walk with God. The synagogue is family-centric. 
It ha- the, the, to, to have a true synagogue, it has to be three houses. It has to be a house of study, a house of prayer, and a house of fellowship. And that's exactly what they were doing. And if you would go to any, any synagogue today across America, one of the th- well, they'll, they'll, they'll kind of show you the sanctuary. That's not what they're really interested in. They will take you to the synagogue's library that they begin investing in everything, not only to study Torah, but all the books that the families might need to help equip their children to walk with God in the things that God is calling them to do. Uh, that's extremely important to them. Why? Because it's all about family. Now, with the birth of the Roman Catholic Church, it followed an esoteric pattern of taking everything away from the family, away from the individual, it institutionalized it, and now you couldn't even have the Word of God. All you knew is what the priest told you, and he was giving magical powers that he could literally re-sacrifice Christ every morning, and it was him that told you spiritually what you were to do, and he and only he could forgive your sins. And so they took all of that away from the, the centralistic part of, of the way that God wants things. It's individual, home, then community. And the problem with the Protestant church is that we have drawn much of the way that we do things from the Roman Catholic Church, we went to Rome and there were a lot of things that we liked when we should have went to Jerusalem and looked for God's pattern in his word. When we get a looking over everything in the Torah, it's family. No wonder, guys, everything in secular society that's going on today is about dismantling God's concept of the family. It destroys his original pattern for walking with him. Just think about that. The greatest attacks we have today is they want to redefine family. They want to redefine marriage. They're wanting to redefine God. People now select what they like in the word and what they don't like in the word as as if it's a buffet and you can choose what you like and discard what you don't like. This is the infallible word of God. It is anointed. It is inspired. And it is his word from Genesis, the first word in Genesis, Bereshit, to where it says the end in the book of Revelation. It's all his word, and we don't have an option of choosing parts that we like and don't like. Our only choice is to believe or not to believe. Now, in the book of Acts, we see that the church uh, went to synagogue every Sabbath to learn the ways of God. In fact, even in, uh, when, when they had the council about what to do with the Gentiles, they gave them some basic instruction of Torah so that they could have fellowship with Jewish people and not offend them. And then they said, Moses, in every city, Moses is taught in every synagogue. And so they would go in the morning and they would um, listen to the teaching of the Torah. And then they would meet at the first of the day which was as the sun was setting on Saturday night, not sunrise on Sunday morning, they would meet together and they would hear the apostles teach their doctrine. And Hebraically, doctrine is how to live. And what they were telling them was how to walk in the ways of God and the commandments of God through Messiah and through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's God's pattern. We need to understand that if homes fall apart, this is where we have been so church-centric or building-centric or organized church-centric that we have forgotten that if the family falls apart, there's nothing left to build a congregation with, that it's about empowering families. It, it is not an entertainment session. It is not a time that you come once or twice a week to be entertained and to give a little motivational speech of, of buck it up, buckaroo, you can go forth and do wonderful things. It is how to walk with God, to enter into his presence, to worship him, to seek his face, and to hear his word, and in fellowship with one another, we encourage one another about the testimonies of this is what's happened in my life when I was walking with God this week. That's church. 
but we've turned it into Greco-Roman theater, and it doesn't need to be that way. It's home first and congregational ministry second. Abraham is our pattern. I want you to grab your Bible, and I want you to go to Romans chapter 4 and verse 16. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking, and I want you to notice some specific things he said to us. Now, when he wrote the book of Romans, he was addressing both uh, the, the Jews that had received Jesus that were a, a part of the, the church there, and he was also addressing the Gentiles that had been integrated into Israel and became a part of the church. And he says, therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be made sure to all the seed, only uh, not to that only which is of the law, but that which also, or that, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Notice he said, the father of us all. Abram believed God, and it was imputed for him to him for righteousness before he was circumcised. That circumcision was a sign of the faith that he had when he met with God. And he believed God, and that belief was imputed to him for righteousness. But when he said father here, that, that is pater in the Greek, and it means generator, father, uh, forefather. Now listen to this. And the authors of a family or a society of persons animated, animated by the same spirit as himself and one who has infused his own spirit into others who actuates and governs their minds. He is the father of us all that we walk with God the same way that Abraham walked with God, that God is calling us out of Babylon, and he's calling us to walk with him, and it is family-based. God chose Abraham because of two things. He loved justice, and he would teach his children the ways of God. Not that the church would teach their children the ways of God, that he would teach them the ways of God. Guys, we got to change some things. In the mind of Paul, Abraham was our father and our example. Abraham built a family that walked with God. Let me say that again. Abraham built a family that walked with God. That's going to be the hope for the remnant. Is individual strong and family strong. Now, home is the place of prayer, a place of worship, and a place of walk. I will go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, and I want to read this this morning out of the complete Jewish Bible because it simply brings out some things just a little bit better. And it said, they heard the voice of Adonai God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. Now, this is talking about during the fall, but the way it is mentioned in Scripture, it was God's habit to come right before the sunset as it was beginning to cool in the evening. He would come and have fellowship with Adam and Eve. Why is this important? Well, in Genesis 1 and 5, it says, and the Lord and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and evening and morning were the first day. In our Greco-Romanized society, we believe that the day starts at sunrise. Yet God stood in darkness and he began in darkness the creation process. And there was no light until he created light and so biblically and this, this deals with the principle of first mention well now anytime that you see the beginning of the day anywhere from genesis to revelation it is talking about sunset not sunrise so even the church when they met on the first day of the week that was saturday evening that's why the apostle paul when he was preaching 
and he preached so long that uh, a, a guy fell out of the wind and, and died, and they pr- r- gathered around him and prayed for him. And uh, God raised him up. It wasn't because on Sunday morning he preached so long, he preached for so many hours, the guy fell asleep. As they had already celebrated the Sabbath, they had been to synagogue, they had had fellowship all day, and that evening as the sun set, they, they, they had fellowship, and then Paul began to preach late Saturday night. And the man fell out of the window. You know, it's, it's amazing when you really understand how to interpret the Word of God, all of a sudden things just start making a lot of sense. And so biblically, a new day begins at sunset, not sunrise. And this is, guys, this is the pattern heaven recognizes. And let me tell you something, too. This is also the pattern that hell recognizes. Adam and Eve would close out their day and begin the next having fellowship with God. This is important. Hear me now. This is important. It shows us several things. During the day man walked in the earth according to God's ways, knowing that he would give an account for his day before God as it was closing. At the very same time, each day he would start fellowship with God. That communion with God would empower him for the new day. So God can take one event, one time of extended fellowship as the old day is closing and the new day is beginning to basically kill two birds with one stone. Our homes need to become the center of our prayer life, the center of our spiritual walk, and a place where our walk with God is the most profound. This, and guys, I've, I've pastored for years and years and years, and I, I have seen not only in my life, in the life of many ministers, church, you, you get a at certain attitude when you go to church. You know, the old, the old saying, the American way is you fight all the way to church and you put a smile on your face when you walk in. All that needs to change. We, we, we have this Greco-Roman mindset that, that church is something we do once or twice a week. No, no. The church is who we are. We are the called out ones of God. And our spirituality must be more in the home and in our, in our walking. I'm looking at ways of increasing this all the time. As I've been studying these things, God has made me aware how that uh, the world has creeped in and, and busyness of ministry has creeped in and all these things have creeped in and it begins choking out a lot of the spirituality in the home. Part of the reset that God is wanting to do is he's wanting us to, to return to his ways as an individual, Get my walk right to where it's 24-7, 365 days a year. I'm walking with God, and I'm learning how to walk with him better each and every day as I get into his word, as I listen to his spirit, and as I fellowship with him. And then as I do, I, I'm, I'm to do that to inspire my family and to bring my family alongside. That's how we get the blessings of God in our home. And so we we need to move from this event thing to a lifestyle of really walking with God. And the church hasn't done that really for a long time. If we follow God's model of what I just shared on on the evening of praying together as a family and and, and fellowshipping with God and and reviewing the day and preparing for the next day, it, it does this biblical pattern does something. We are communing with God while it is still day and going into the night. This brings the guidance, the grace, and the provision of God into our day before darkness is established and keeps it at bay spiritually. The Bible says that the devil loves darkness. He likes to move in the darkness. For those of you that have in in your ministry, your personal walk ever come against the occult, the witching hours from midnight to three in the morning. And so while you're sleeping, they're doing their work and they're setting all these things up in the spirit realm to come against the church, to come against the family, to come against the things of God. And if we follow God's pattern before the sun even sets, one of the things that that I do and my wife does is we ask God to bring his kingdom into the next 24 hours, that he would go before us in time and prepare the way. 
that he would knock away the snares of the enemy, that he would give us the grace uh, to walk in his love, to walk in his power, and to walk in his purpose during that next day. So if we pray at the, at the, the way that God tells us to in his word, we have one foot in the day, one foot in the night, inviting God to fill the next day and to push back the influences of darkness from our home, from our family. Now that's powerful. That's, that's a vital part of spiritual warfare. The next thing that we need to understand, God is not satisfied with just meeting you once a week. He didn't go to the cross so that you could be religious. He went to the cross so that you could be family and real family, close family, the family that you can really count on that understands or our family that you want to be around all the time. I was telling my wife last night, you know, when, when, the, when I'm working up here at the office and it comes 4 o'clock, my heart starts beating just a little bit faster. And, and I get in my car and I begin to drive home. And the closer uh, I get to the house, the more excited I get because I know she's there. And I'm really looking forward to spending the evening with her and, and to be able to see her and tell her about my day. That's really the way God is. God didn't save you for you to visit him once a week. God saved you so that he could dwell with you, that he could walk with you. We need to understand and be established in the love of God. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 20. And I want you to try to wrap your head around this, and, and I'm doing the same thing. We need to have a deeper understanding of God's love for us. Let's look at this. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Now, the specific things he's talking about here is not love for one another or even love for God. He's talking about being rooted and grounded in God's love for you. That's the gospel. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that those who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel is a gospel of love because God wanted his family back. And Paul was saying, now I want Christ to dwell in you richly. Dwell talks about a, a continuing thing. It's not a visit. It's not meeting with God once a week. It's living with him 24-7, letting him dwell in us so that I can understand just how much he loves us, how much he loves me, how much he loves my family. He said, I wanted you to be rooted and grounded in this and may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. <coughs> What's he talking about here? If we ever really understood the magnitude of the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height of God's love for us, it would radically change your life. That's why this thing is, is home base. It's about empowering the remnant, not in just what we're doing. This is what heaven is doing right now. It's centering back up on the remnant while everybody else is playing church. God said, remnant, I love you. I want to come and dwell with you and walk with you and be with you all the time. I want to have communion with you. I, I want to have fellowship with you. I want to have intimacy with you. I want to be more real to you than the very breath in your body. Well, how, how big is this love? What is the breadth and the height and the depth of it? Almighty God in the garden was betrayed by his family. Eve was tricked. Adam betrayed him. That's why it's called the sin of Adam, not the sin of Eve. And yet immediately God sets a plan into motion that takes him 4,000 years to implement. Phase one of it. 
in the fourth day or the 4,000th year, Almighty God, the Bible tells us in Colossians, he emptied himself of, of his divine privileges and he humbled himself to become a man and walk among us. He was born of a virgin. And he patiently waited 30 years before he began his ministry because any priest could not begin really ministering as a priest until they were 30 years of age, according to Torah. And for three and a half years, he lived the Torah cycle, the original Torah cycle as given by Moses before all of Israel. And then he went and he gave his life, his fleshly life for us. He shed his blood for us, not only to forgive our sins, but to get us back. Do you hear me? To, it, it, was, it was a redemption. He redeemed us. He purchased us back because we had been stolen of the devil. And then he rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and now he's working on phase two. When he comes back, he's getting ready to kick the devil out of his house. The devil's going in a bottomless pit that's not going to be connected to this planet. And he is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And this earth is going to know unprecedented peace because the Father is in his house. I don't know about you, but that just makes me happy. And that is the breath. If I can understand that he so loved me, and you need to understand that he so loved you, that he left heaven and gave his life for you. In the Greek where it's agape, uh, really is a, there's a hindrance with that word because in the Greeks, for the Greek mind, Agape was this philosophical absolute type of love that their gods did not even possess. Zeus had come down to steal your woman if he got half a chance. They were more petty and more manipulative than the people that they were supposed to be over. So although they had the word, they didn't understand. The corresponding word in Hebrew literally means a breathless you know, it's like going on that first, second, or third date. There's all this anticipation that you're going to be with this, with this woman that, uh, that you really this, are starting to fall in love with, and you can't wait to be with her, and you become breathless. God so breathlessly loved the world, and that great anticipation of getting his family back caused him to give his only begotten son that he could rescue them and redeem them to, to take them back because they originally belonged to him because he loved them. And he gave up the very best that heaven had himself to get you back. Now do you understand the depth? And it's, it's so big, it's almost unfathomable, yet it's brought up in the simple children's song Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Oh, friend. Now listen what happens. If I, if I can get grounded in this love for me, it explodes in my personal life. It begins to explode in my family. Let's pick up verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. It's something greater than you can wrap your head around. You know it in your spirit if you'll actually meditate on it and study scriptures and let God get this deep down in your heart. It's going to pass knowledge. You're going to start freaking people out because you have such confidence in God because you understand just how much he loves you. And that love is not excuse to sin like people are preaching about grace today, when I understand how much he loves me, I can't help but reciprocate that love by living for him. That ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Oh, 
You see, God wants to fill up some things in your life. I think where we have real problems in our life is where God isn't. Maybe he's not in your finances the way that it should be. Maybe you don't allow him on your work site. You don't allow him in the way that you do your job, or you may not allow him really in the way that you, you treat your maid or treat your children. Or There are so many areas, or even the way you treat your own body. But as I allow God to fill all those areas, he brings prosperity, he brings, he brings health, he brings joy. As he begins to fill me up with him, his love begins to take over. And I have a confidence in God. I have a confidence in my walk with God that enables me from going from Abram in Babylon to Abraham, the friend of God, that is available to you and I through the power of Jesus Christ, through the power of the cross and his shed blood, when I realize God has called me to walk with him. Now let's go on to say what he said, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do a few things. He's just going to enable you to get by. Or he's just going to enable you to, to just hold on until, uh, until you both go on to be with the Lord, but you're not going to be able to have a good marriage now. You see, that's the way people want to interpret this. Understanding God's love for us opens the door for his fullness to come in our lives, in our families, in our marriage, in our workplace, into our health, into our children, to our grandchildren. The Bible says the blessing of the Lord on the righteous go up to a thousand generations. We have what we have today because a guy named Abraham walked with God. And he was willing to give up his son of promise, Isaac, for God. That opened the door for God to give his son to ransom his people. Now listen to this. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Now, what's the power that works in us? Now, he, is, he wants to do, it, you know, it, it would have been just nice if he had said just exceedingly. I mean, that'd be great. Or he wants to do abundantly. But the apostle Paul didn't stop there. He said, listen, I want you to get your heads around this. God wants to do exceedingly abundantly. That means you take abundantly and you multiply it a whole bunch of times. That's what God wants to do in your life. How is he going to do it? According to the power, the power of what? The power of his love. Because that's really the subject of what he's writing about here. I want you to be established in his love. I want you to know the height, the breadth, the depth, and the width of his love so that when you understand it, he, you'll be, God will be able to fill every part of your life and that power of his love will begin causing you to have exceedingly abundantly above what you can ask or think. Now, guys, if you're not having church right now, something's wrong. Come on now. If all you're hearing are words right now and you're not getting happy, something's wrong. The devil has stolen your understanding of God's love for you. You cannot earn God's love. God loved us while we were yet sinners and gave his son for us. But now that I have received him, God is saying, now you can move beyond love 101. Let's go ahead and go to the graduate level of love. I'm giving you the kingdom. I've made you a citizen of the kingdom of God. I've brought you into family. If you let me become family, I'll take care of you. I'll protect your household. I'll keep sickness and disease away from your household. I'll make sure that you have a job that I can bless so that your house can have the things in it that you need. 
I'm going to see to it that you have the wisdom that you need. You have the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit that can go into operation, not just to share the gospel, which is extremely important because we've got a bunch of family that's missing that we're supposed to seek out and tell them the good news. Daddy wants you to come home. He paid the price for you. But he says, I want to move in. I want to begin taking care of you the way that a father can. How many know God is not moved by the economy? God is not moved by sickness and disease. God's not sick. He doesn't give sickness and disease. Heaven, it doesn't have an energy crisis. It doesn't have a money crisis. There's no stock market. It goes up and down. It is constant. It is perfect abundance that never runs out. You're saying right now, Mike, what you're telling me is what all the other preachers are telling me. God's going to make me a millionaire. No, he's not. Not unless you're going to become a financier for major things in the kingdom of God. God's not going to make you rich just so that you can live in a mansion and forget about him. The Bible says that, yeah, that we, don't, we, we, we should not forget that he gives us the power to create wealth so that his covenant would be established. God blesses you not so that you can drive a Ferrari, but so that you can fund the gospel, so that you can help families move forward in God. Oh, man. I don't know about you, but I'm ready. I am ready for some of this exceedingly abundantly. We've tried to give money to get that to come in. This sow and seed, sow and seed, sow and seed, sow and seed. And I'm a seed sower, guys. I love to give. In fact, I, I, I was just sharing with Mary here just there. I said, you know, really, if God would just bring in a portion of the seed that I have sown over the years, we would never have another need the rest of our lives. And so I, I believe in sowing. I believe in giving. I'm a giver. I'll, if God, if the Holy Spirit moves on me, I'll give, I'll give everything off the shelves that we have here at the ministry to somebody in need. And many times we've had visitors that have walked away with a load because I just sensed in my spirit, they need this, they need this, and they need this, and I just take it off the shelves and give them DVD sets or give them books or whatever because I wanted them to go on. God was expressing his love through me. But you see, that, that's a part of flowing in the love of God, but you can't, that will not function right if you're not established in how much God loves you. Because it always works this way. He loves me and sets me free so that I can love him and then love others. And it keeps that love in balance because I get then go to begin searching the word of God and searching the Torah to find out how his kingdom operates because I don't want sloppy agape that gives excuse for sin and, and, and opens up doors to bring the devil in. I want a love that is strong, that is sure that I have confidence in him, that when he says, don't do this, that he knows there's a reason why I shouldn't do this. I may not understand it, but he knows that it will create an open door in my life. It will create a gap in my hedge of protection if I do it. God said, don't do it. I'm not going to do it. If God says, do it, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to learn as I begin doing it, and I'll gain insights as the Holy Spirit teaches me, establishes me in his love, and I begin really trusting in that love, then I know he's never going to tell me to do something that is harmful to me, but only empowers me. Have you understood a little bit more about the love of God? It ought to make you and your family want to pray and seek his face every night. You see, it's a time for us on, on a personal level and on a family level. What God is calling for us for is a time of devotion, a time in the Word, a time in worship, and a time in prayer. We say, Mike, I don't, I don't play an instrument. Sure you do. It's called an iPod or an iPhone or an MP3 player. One of the things I, I love about iTunes, and I know there's, there's Winamp and a whole lot of other programs out there, is I can, and I've got every CD that I own, I've dumped into iTunes. 
from Paul Wilbur to Big Daddy Weave and everything in between. But you know what? You can actually mix your own playlist. And you can turn a lot of things into church. You can, uh, the, I, I shared with, uh, I think on the last video that uh, Mary and I were heading to Springfield. We didn't like what was on the radio. I pulled out my iPhone and, and uh, put in uh, Phillips Craig Dean, I believe it was. And by the time we got to Springfield, tears were rolling down our face. I mean, we were having church driving down the highway. Guys, I have had church. I have had wonderful worship experiences on an elliptical walker with, with earphones on and, and just simply playing praise and worship. And God came and visited me on the treadmill. So we, we can have worship all the time in our homes. We, uh, you don't need to be able to have to play the piano or play a guitar or, or play some instrument. All you got to do is put on the music and enter into it and just open up your heart to God. It's time that our homes are full of prayer. It's time that our homes are filled with something besides the evening news that needs to be filled with the reading of God's word and it needs to be filled with praise and worship. With those things going on in a home, how could God not do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask or think? That's part of this jubilee, home-based. Now, I've been watching and I've been reading a lot of the things that are being uh, written on the Internet, and I, I think that a lot of people are sensing God is moving his emphasis to the home. I think that's extremely important because even if you have a congregation, Pastor, hear me. If you have a congregation full of sick families, you're going to have a sick church. If you have a congregation full of strong families, you're going to have a strong church. And so God is emphasizing the church. And I think some have mistakenly, when they look at all the craziness that's going on and on, on Christian television and in so many churches, uh, there are several that have announced that God's done with organized church. I don't necessarily believe that because I believe there are a lot of good churches still out there. There are a lot of good messianic congregations still out there. There's a lot of good spirit-filled congregations that are still out there that love God. They're staying true to the word, uh, where they are with God. They're staying true to the cross. They're staying true to the name of Jesus. And they ignore all the squirreliness and say, you know what, we're not a part of that. So that's fine. But whether we have a congregational ministry or you're part of the remnant that, has, that uh, is not a part of a local congregation, God is uh, right now, all of heaven in this year of Jubilee is about reestablishing his presence, his purpose, and his power in your home. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you this morning. Father, I thank you for your presence that I feel here this morning. I thank you for the anointing that is on your word. And I thank you for your love. I thank you that while we were yet sinners, that you so loved us that you gave your son on the cross to redeem us. And Father, I ask that you would release a fresh anointing right now in everyone, in the hearts of everyone who hears this message, whether they listen on audio, watch it on YouTube, or, or have a DVD. Father, I ask that you would release a fresh anointing to comprehend your love for us and that we begin walking conscious of that love and of that favor in our day-to-day -day lives. Holy Spirit, come and teach us this truth. Establish us in this truth, I ask. In Jesus' name. This is partner time now at Biblical Life. And I just want to take a few moments to thank our partners and our friends your daily prayers for us, and your monthly giving to this ministry enables us to do so much. It enables us to produce the videos, to produce the DVDs, and allows us to expand the vision of what God has called us to do. Now, if you're a part of the remnant and you have been disenfranchised from a local congregation and you're using our, our video casts, uh, to feed yourself and to feed your family, and in, in essence, we have become a virtual church for you, I want you to spend some time in prayer about 
giving your tithe to this ministry. There is, there is a direct link in the Word of God going all the way back to Abraham when Melchizedek came and revealed to him the mystery of Messiah with the bread and the wine that he gave the tithe to where he got spiritual revelation. And then, of course, it went to the Levites that were, their duties were to train the people in the commandments of God in the Old Testament. And then it comes over to those that you, that you look to that feed your family. There, there is a spiritual dynamic involved in the tithe. And uh, if you have never studied that out, we do have a YouTube video uh, up there called The Spiritual Dynamics of the Tithe. I encourage you to watch it. Now, if you're already a part of a local congregation, your tithe belongs to your local pastor. But I would ask that you pray about maybe supporting us on a monthly basis to allow us to expand what we're doing. There's still a blessing there. Now, at Biblical Life, we're never going to promise you that uh, the seas will part or that angels will come to your house if you give. What we do promise you is what the Word of God clearly says, that as you actively fund those ministries that speak into your life, it opens up your heart and it opens up your life for greater revelation. Now, I want to end this segment with praying for you. Father, I just thank you for every partner, Father, for every member of the remnant that has ever given to this ministry. Father, I water the seeds that they have sown with prayer. And Father, I ask that it would spring forth in great revelation. Father, that they would see insights deeper from the Word of God than ever before. That you would allow them to begin functioning in the kingdom with a fresh anointing and fresh insights from your Word. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. You can go onto our church website and donate online, or you can just simply mail in your love gift to Biblical Life Assembly at Post Office Box 588, Marshfield, Missouri, 65706. God bless.